So today's lesson is going to be on trigonometric ratios. Uh, in particular, we're going to focus with trigonometric ratios on a unit circle, but just in general, we'll focus on uh, trigonometric ratios on the Cartesian plane. Of course, when we talk about trigonometric ratios, we are talking about, of course, sine, cosine, and tangent, um, but we'll get into a few more details that we'll need to uh, understand here today as well. Let's get going. So we're going to spend today working with trigonometric ratios on the Cartesian plane. So in other words, your X and your Y grid. Uh, the main idea will be that we want to get a trigonometric ratio from either a coordinate or from an angle. So if I said you had a certain coordinate on the Cartesian plane that an angle and standard position went through, you need to be able to figure out how to get a trig ratio from that. And likewise, if I gave you an angle on the Cartesian plane, whether it's in degrees or radians, you'll also need to know how to get a trigonometric ratio out of that. We'll also look at how to solve trigonometric expressions for unusual domains. This will basically be where instead of having from zero to 360 degrees or uh, zero to two pi radians, uh, you'll have some other really weird domain. Basically, it's a whole random mix today, but I think we'll do just fine. Let's get going. Oops, too far. There we go. Here we go. Uh, so coordinates on the unit circle. Suppose this circle is a unit circle. Just remember a unit circle, of course, is a circle centered on the Cartesian plane with a radius of one. Draw a positive angle theta in standard position that terminates on the unit circle. So pretty open thing there, which just wants us to draw an angle. So I'll just draw an angle, let's say right here. We'll call that my angle theta. You could draw it pretty much anywhere, just as long as it's in standard position. So as long as it's coming out of the, uh, the origin point here and using the positive X axis. Uh, now it says, write a general statement that could be used to represent the coordinates of that point. So in other words, we wanna find the coordinates X, Y, of this point on the unit circle. Well, in order to do this, let's focus on this angle as being part of a right triangle. If I imagine this as being a right triangle right here, this dimension of the right triangle is gonna be our X coordinate, and this dimension over here will be our Y coordinate. Now, we have an angle here. You know, it's just a, a generalized angle, but you know, we could have said it was whatever. Um, the only other thing in this triangle that we actually know is the fact that this is a unit circle. So therefore this has a hypotenuse, which is the radius of the circle of one. Now watch where I'm gonna go with this. Notice your X is your adjacent side of your triangle. And we're working with this angle in the corner here. Since X is the adjacent side of this triangle, we can use cosine to model it as such. We can say it's cosine theta equals X, which is your adjacent side over your hypotenuse, which is one. But here's the funny thing, x over one, well, that of course, that's just x, right? So there's no, there's no real difference there. So cosine theta equals x in this case, as long as you're on a unit circle. Now, likewise, if we look at our y value, notice that's the opposite side of our triangle. So we can say sine of theta is our opposite side, which is y over the hypotenuse, which is one. But just like before, y over one, that's just equal to y. Long story short, when you have a unit circle, your X coordinate on your unit circle is just gonna be equal to cosine of your angle. And your Y coordinate is gonna equal sine of your angle. Now, I've had in the past students get kind of, you know, confused as to which one's which. Um, really, if you think of cosine as an adjacent side, you'll see that it's an X and, and sine is an opposite side, it's gonna be a Y. Uh, but another way I've had students remember this in the past as well, is uh, you write a coordinate X, Y, Notice that's in the order they, they appear in the alphabet, of course, X and then Y. Uh, cosine also appears earlier in the alphabet than sine does. So whatever floats your boat, whatever, uh, whatever kind of works for you, right? So anyway, the way we could represent the coordinates of this point, uh, the coordinates to the point would be cosine theta, sine theta, right? Your X and your Y. Cool. Next uh, slide here. What are the maximum and minimum values for cosine theta and sine theta? And at what angles do they occur? Okay, so we know cosine theta is just pretty much code for X and uh, sine theta is just code for Y, right? Uh, so if we're looking for our cosine theta's max and min, the maximum value of cosine is gonna be our maximum value of X. Well, the biggest value of X, the furthest we go over on our X scale here is right over here. Now at this point right over here, notice that your unit circle has a radius of one, that just must be X is equal to one. And if X is equal to one is your maximum X, that means your maximum cosine is also one. As for your minimum, the lowest we go for our X is over here. That would be negative one, because again, it has a radius of one, so that would be negative one. 
And you probably can guess the same idea here with sine. Sine, of course, as we learned on the last slide, sine is just our y value here. Uh, y in this case, the highest we go is also going to be one. So our max for sine theta is also one. And then our minimum here is going to be negative one as well. Now, uh, next question here, it says, one can see that tan 90 degrees or tan pi over four if you're using radians. Um, hold on, tan pi over four, that's not correct at all. It wouldn't be tan pi over four, that'd be tan pi over two. Ooh, that's a typo there. Make sure you change that in there. I, I missed that somehow. Tan pi over two, sorry, if using radians, uh, is undefined. Uh, if you don't believe me, whether you're in uh, degree mode or radian mode, just put those into your calculator right now. Tan 90 if you're in degree mode and tan pi over two if you're in radian mode. Uh, you're going to see it's undefined. Now, the question is, why is that? Is tangent undefined anywhere else, or is that just the only place it's undefined? Well, let's break down what tan actually is. Tan of an angle can be defined as being your opposite side over your adjacent side. At 90 degrees, so right up here, you're going to see that tan has an opposite side that is kind of ill-defined, like is like, is that your Y? If it's your Y, then maybe opposite is like one, like what's, what's opposite your angle here? Um, but your adjacent side, which goes this way, it's almost like undoubtedly zero. Well, one divided by zero, you can't divide by zero at all, right? So that's just completely undefined. Now, is there anywhere else where you think we'd be having a divide by zero? Well, hopefully you see the other place would actually be down here, right? So at 90 degrees, and at 270 degrees, or in other words, if you want to use radians, pi over two, not pi over four, pi over four is 45 degrees. I don't know how that uh, got in there. Pi over two or three pi over two, those of course would be points at which, or angles rather I should say, at which tan would be undefined. Uh, another way of uh, expressing tan, just by the way, notice we found before that since on a unit circle at very least, uh, cosine was your X and sine was your Y, because cosine really was just equal to your adjacent side and sine was just equal to your opposite side. You could actually also write tan as being your sine of your angle divided by your cosine of your angle. This is actually something called a trigonometric identity. We'll get into that later on in, I think, chapter number six when we get there, but still kind of, kind of interesting to know. All right, so here's an example. The point Q, which is negative four over five and three over five, is on the intersection point between the unit circle and the terminal arm of an angle theta in standard position. Determine the exact values of the three primary trigonometric ratios, so sine, cosine, and tan. Well, here's what's nice. It told us in this question that point Q is on the unit circle. So guess what? Let's just draw that in there. Negative four over five, that's almost negative one. So that's pretty far over in terms of our X. And then three over five, I would say that point's probably about right there. And then we'll draw our angle. Yoink, our angle would be this whole thing right there. <laughs> now, so it wants us to get the uh, exact values of the three primary trig ratios. Well, the trig ratios really only work inside of a right triangle. So guess what? We're just going to have to make a right triangle here. And this angle right here is not going to be our theta, but it's going to be the related reference angle. So theta r. That's what I'll just call it for now. Now, we know our x coordinate, our y coordinate. We know x is negative 4 over 5. We know y is 3 over 5. And because this is a unit circle, we actually also know what our hypotenuse is. We know that's one. So if we wanted to get exact values of the three trig ratios for theta, we don't even know what theta is. We can actually just set this up using the sides of this triangle here. Now, for all intents and purposes, we can use our reference angle to determine these trig ratios. That's all well and good. Uh, another thing I'll remind you of, I, I hope it's not throwing too much on you all at once here, but when you're dealing on a Cartesian grid like this, the cast rule, does apply. The cast rule just basically says what trig ratio will be positive and what trig ratio will be negative in any given quadrant. Cosine is positive here, all are positive here, sine is positive over here, and tan is positive over there. But anyway, that's maybe putting the cart before the horse here. Let's uh, polish this off. So we'll start with sine. Sine of our angle, sine is just opposite over hypotenuse. So we have three over five over one. I'm not even going to write that whole thing out. Three over five divided by one, that's clearly just going to be three over five. And it shouldn't be a surprise to us because remember, on a unit circle, your y coordinate is your sine value, right? So sine, your y coordinate, y coordinate, sine. Only on a unit circle, but still really important. Uh, as for cosine, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So negative four over five over one, which of course is just negative four over five. 
Or likewise, of course, we should know that cosine on a unit circle is just your x value. Now to spice things up here though, tan theta, this one's gonna be a little beefier. Tan is equal to opposite over adjacent. This one, unfortunately, we do have to calculate. So the opposite side is three over five over the adjacent side, which is root, or sorry, negative four over five. Uh, so notice in this, we have a fraction divided by a fraction. Dividing fractions kind of sucks, but what I do instead is I keep the first one. So I keep three over five, change the division to a multiplication, and then I flip the other one. So I'll make that five over negative four. So what that'll simplify to is uh, three times five, which is 15 over five times negative four, which is negative 20. Having a negative in the bottom just kind of sucks. So I'll move that to the top and 15 over 20, that simplifies to three over four. So we'll make this negative three over four. That right there, that is the 10 of our angle. 10 does not show up as one of your coordinates. Rather, it shows up as your sine over your cosine, or in other words, your y over your x. Maybe that's another way of putting it. That's, that's actually kind of an interesting way of thinking of it. Uh, notice also by the cast rule, I know that is a total throwback to math 20, um, but from the cast rule, notice the only thing in this quadrant that's actually positive was sine. Sine was the only one that was a positive number. Go figure, right? So kind of cool. Basically, we just use the coordinate we have and we can get trig ratios out of that. So from that question on the very first slide, like the, the today's plan thing, we have just gotten trig ratios from a coordinate. We just were given a coordinate on a unit circle. We were able to get trig ratios. And the nice thing is, even if this wasn't a unit circle, if we were given some coordinates, you can still get your trig ratios. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure we did that actually back in math 20-1. I know it's probably been a while for some of you, but still good to know. Now, what if I told you sine, cosine, and tan? What if they're not the only trig ratios? Ooh, Nelly, I just got chills, right? You have been told your whole life, most likely, that sine, cosine, and tangent, that's it. Those are the trig ratios. Nah, chief, there's actually more than that, right? There's three others that we're going to need to know of. Let's get into them. These three other trig ratios are often known as the reciprocal trigonometric ratios. So again, sine, cosine, and tangent, they're not the only ones. There's three others that see some frequent use. The good news is, if you're already sweating here, going like, oh no, there's more trig ratios. The good news is that all three of these are the reciprocal, that means like the flipped upside down version of the three primary trig ratios. So the flipped over upside down ones of sine, cosine, and tangent. So just remember, uh, a reciprocal is a, of a number is just simply one over the number. You just flip it, put one on top, uh, put the number on the bottom. Now, if that number was originally a fraction, you just flip the fraction, right? So if it was like four over five, it becomes five over four. You just flip the fraction around, okay? So let's introduce these ratios. Here's a little, little table that we'll fill out here. So for each primary trig ratio, they have a reciprocal trig ratio. So a flipped upside down version of that primary one. Let's start with sine. The reciprocal of sine has a bit of a weird name, but bear with me on this one. The reciprocal of sine is called cosecant. Very strange, cosecant. Now it's abbreviation, like for sine, it was S-I-N, but the abbreviation for cosecant is C-S-C. -C. So we could say C-S-C -C theta, cosecant of an angle. Remember, because sine, cosine, tangent, as well as all these reciprocals, they're going to take in an angle. Now, the ratio inside of a triangle, if we had some sort of a triangle here, right? There's our theta, there's our right angle. This is our opposite side. This is our adjacent, and this is our hypotenuse. The ratio in a triangle is just the reciprocal of sine's ratio. Now, sine is usually opposite over hypotenuse. So the reciprocal of opposite over hypotenuse would be hypotenuse over opposite. That's what cosecant is, hypotenuse over opposite. So you just have to remember cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. I'll tell you an easier way of remembering this in a moment, but it is what it is. Now, in terms of the ratio in a unit circle, if we had some sort of a unit circle, that was a terrible circle, but you get the idea. Remember, we have a hypotenuse of one. X is our adjacent side. Y is our opposite side and our angles right there, kind of really small in the, in the middle there. Uh, inside of a unit circle, it's just, again, your hypotenuse over opposite. Well, your uh, hypotenuse inside of a unit circle is just one and your opposite in a unit circle is your y coordinate. So the ratio in a unit circle would be one over y. So that's the reciprocal of sine. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. Now, as for cosine, 
the reciprocal of this one is, and you might actually see a pattern here, the reciprocal of cosine is something just called secant. Notice how sine had a co and cosine had something without a co. Basically, everything has a co, right? That's one way of remembering it. Now, for the abbreviation of secant, it's exactly what you probably would think it would be. It's just SEC, sec, right? And then theta, awesome. Secant theta, awesome. Now, the ratio in a triangle in terms of uh, opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse, it's just the uh, reciprocal of cosine. Well, cosine was adjacent over hypotenuse, so this one's going to be hypotenuse over adjacent. And then lastly, the ratio in a unit circle, if it's hypotenuse over adjacent in a unit circle, that's going to be 1 is our hypotenuse, and our adjacent is our x coordinate. So 1 over x, that would be our secant. Now, tangent, this one has the absolute best reciprocal name. You're not going to forget this one. The reciprocal of tangent is literally just called cotangent. That's where that rule where I said everything needs a co, that really comes in handy here, right? So cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent. Awesome. Can't even argue with that. As for the abbreviation, it also has a pretty nice one. It's just cot, C-O-T, and then uh, theta, of course. So cot theta, cotangent theta. Now, hopefully you remember tangent is opposite over adjacent. Cotangent is just adjacent over opposite. Awesome. Now, last up here inside of a unit circle, if tan was opposite over adjacent and cotangent is adjacent over opposite, well, adjacent is your x, your opposite is your y, so this is just going to be x over y. That's all there is to those. Now, you might be wondering, why do we care? Honestly, I'm there's not, there's not very many reasons why we care. I, I wish I had a better answer than that. Um, there are some situations where it's just better to simplify something down to one of these reciprocals. But if you're looking for an actual practical use for solving triangles and solving things on a, a Cartesian plane, honestly, sine, cosine, and tangent, they, they have your bases covered, right? These are just some other options. Uh, there's no button on your calculator for any of these. So that makes them, uh, unfortunately, even less useful. But uh, yeah, enjoy that basically, right? So uh, that is what it is, right? You can always find the value of sine, cosine, and tangent, and then just take one over whatever that value is. That, that's about it. That's all we really got here. Wish I had a better answer for you, but it is what it is. Now, one last thing on these. Uh, just remember, every trig ratio needs a co-version. So like cosine, it gets secant because co is already the co-version. Everything needs a co-version. Now, yes, I understand it would make more sense for sine and cosine to be paired this way, so that like cosine was the reciprocal of sine. No, that's just not how they did things, right? So don't shoot the messenger. I didn't come up with this. Uh, as a matter of fact, off the top of my head, I don't know why they did, did it that way. Uh, there probably is a really good reason. Google it. Sure, I'm sure you'll be able to find something on that one. Anyway, here's some examples. Let's suppose we have the point negative 7, 5, and it's on the terminal arm of angle theta in standard position. What is the exact value of all six trig ratios for theta? Ooh, woof, right? So instead of doing just the, the three primary ones, we got six to do. I would start by drawing a little picture. It doesn't have to be anything special. Notice how big these X and Ys are. I think you can hopefully tell this is not going to be on a unit circle. So don't go assuming the hypotenuse is one unless it says it's on a uh, unit circle, right? So anyway, I'll do my grid here. Negative seven, five. X is negative seven, Y is five. That means it's going to be up in this quadrant. Uh, just by the way, if you want to use your cast rule, C A S T, uh, we should know sine should be the only thing that's positive, but I want us to watch the reciprocal ratios as well. Something funny might happen with that. Anyway, to get to all six trig ratios, let's make a right triangle right here. Uh, we know our X coordinate is negative seven. We know our Y coordinate is five. We don't know what our hypotenuse is. I'm gonna move that uh, S in the cast rule out here just so we don't confuse that. Uh, Anyway, we don't know what the hypotenuse is. The good news is because this is a right triangle, just use Pythagoras. Let's get that done. So negative seven squared plus five squared equals, we'll just call it H squared. I often call it R squared for like a radius, but it is what it is. Uh, that's gonna be 49 plus 25 equals H squared. I think that's 74 equals H squared. Now, notice it says it wants the exact value. That means there's no rounding things. So guess what? I don't even have to touch my calculator here. Square root both sides. I know the square root of 74 is like eight something. I'm not going to worry about that though. Uh, so H equals the square root of 74. Boom. That's the exact value. I'll even throw that in there. Square root of 74. Awesome. Now, just for fun. Oop. Don't mean to make this mark here. We're going to need that space clean. You better watch out. Just for fun, I'm going to change pen color, though. 
let's use blue here. Uh, so I want all six trig ratios. Let's start with the ones we know, right? Might as well start where we're, where we're good, right? So sine of theta is going to equal your opposite side over your hypotenuse. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So this is going to be five over square root 74. Done. We don't have to worry about anything else. Some people really don't like having a square root in a denominator. So you have to like rationalize that. Forget it. I'm not about that noise right now. Let's, let's just move on. Cosine theta. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. The adjacent side is negative seven. Hypotenuse is square root 74. Boom, done. Two down, four to go. Tan theta. Well, tan is opposite over adjacent. So five over negative seven. Honestly, I hate having a negative on the bottom. So I'm gonna write that as negative five over seven. It's the same thing. It's just always nice having a negative up on the top. Same idea though, right? Now remember what I said a moment ago though? I said using the cast rule, the only thing that should be positive here is sine. What do you know? We actually got that. So that's exactly what we were hoping for. Now we got to deal with our reciprocal ratios. So the reciprocal of sine is cosecant. You'll just have to remember those, right? It's, it's an unfortunate reality here, but cosecant, well, actually, now that I mention it, I think they actually might be on your formula sheet. Actually, I think, I think they are on your formula sheet, abbreviations and everything, and the fact that it's a reciprocal of sine. Anyway, though, reciprocal of sine is cosecant. That's going to be CSC. So cosecant theta, just take the reciprocal of that fraction, right? So it's going to be root 74 over five. Yeah, that's, that's it. We don't even have to look at this anymore. We already had our original ratio. We just take the reciprocal of it. Another reason why you might be thinking, why do we do this? Well, it is what it is. Uh, reciprocal of cosine, well, that's secant. So secant theta, that's going to be the reciprocal of this. Uh, again, I hate having a negative on the bottom. So as much as I'd love to go like root 74 over negative seven, I'm just going to put the negative up on top. So negative root 74 over seven. It's just always nicer having a negative on top. It just, it is what it is, right? Uh, as for the uh, reciprocal of tan, oh, this is the nice one, cotangent. That one, nobody ever forgets that one. Cotangent theta, uh, just the reciprocal of this. So uh, negative seven over five. There it is, right? That wasn't so bad. At least I hope it wasn't so bad, right? Basically, just make sure you find everything you need to know about your triangle. The positives and negatives, it's important to keep track of them. So, so you have the, the proper sign on your, on your trig ratio here, whether it's positive or negative. But the cast rule can come around and help you out as well. What I want to get with the cast rule is if sine is positive, the reciprocal of sine will also be positive. So with sine being positive, cosecant also positive. That would go the same for all these others. If tan was positive, cotan is also going to be positive, right? The reciprocal doesn't change sine. That's all I'm saying. Moving on. So from the last example, how could we evaluate for the, appropriate, uh, the approximate measure to the nearest tenth uh, of angle theta in degrees? Well, this is kind of a hilarious question. Uh, we want to find what theta is. Hopefully, oops, hopefully you guys remember if I just switch back here. Uh, hopefully you remember to get theta, you just take inverse sine or inverse cos or inverse tan, and that helps you dig out theta. Now, really though, what's funny um, is we, we really, first of all, should never use inverse trig on a negative number. So that kind of tells me I want to use it on sine. Uh, but also just keep in mind the angle that we're going to get, that's just our reference angle. Right? So we got to be mindful of that as well, and we have to deal with it appropriately, especially because we're in quadrant two there. Anyway, what I would do uh, to evaluate for the appro uh, approximate measure to the nearest tenth of angle theta, uh, pick any of these trig ratios. I mean, you probably don't want to use your reciprocal ones because there's no button in your calculator for it. Pick any of these trig ratios. If they're negative, just ignore it. Use inverse trig on them. Get that angle, but that'll be a reference angle. Find the true one. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to use sine just because it's more clear. Let's use inverse sine. Inverse sine of, what was that again? Five over root 74. So inverse sine of five over root 74. Give me two seconds here. Just make sure you're in degree mode in your calculator. Inverse sine of five over square root 74. That's going to give me 35.5 degrees. That's to the nearest 10th, right? Keep in mind though, that is our reference angle. If we are in quadrant two, our reference angle is just this piece here, just right between this and the nearest x-axis. Well, the nearest x-axis is 180 degrees. So guess what? We're going lower than 180 degrees. We have to subtract away the 35.5. So 180 minus 35.5. 180 minus 35.5. Oh, of course, that's 144.5 degrees. There it is. That would be the approximate measure to the nearest tenth of angle theta in degrees. 
And what about radians? Okay, so what you do for radians is you can do inverse trig again, just make sure you're in radian mode. Or let's be real here. Let's just take this number, 144.5 degrees, and let's change it into radians. Remember to change uh, degrees into radians, multiply by what you want. Well, I want radians, so that'll be 2 pi over what we want to get rid of. Well, the equivalent of 2 pi is 360. So 144.5 times 2 pi, and then divided by 360. We just want this to the nearest tenth, so it is what it is. I got 2.5. Five, two. And just remember, radians don't have any units, but if that makes you really uncomfortable, you can literally write radians next to it, right? But the answer is just 2.52, right? But if you want to say radians, go for it, okay? Moving on, we're almost done for today. At least I hope we are. Shouldn't take too much longer, I, I hope. Just a few more things. Anyway, here we go. So without using a calculator, determine whether each trig ratio will be positive or negative. Okay, so this is kind of a bit of a pain. Um, bear with me on this though. Remember earlier when I was mentioning the cast rule? That's exactly what this is referring to here. So the cast rule tells you whether something is positive or negative in each quadrant. Our job in each of these though will be to figure out which quadrant which of these fall into. Now, 250 degrees, hopefully you see that that's going to be in this quadrant right here. It's in the T quadrant. The only thing that should be positive in that quadrant is tan and therefore it's reciprocal cotan. This is cosine, so guess what? That one is negative. Done, right? Next one, five pi over three. Five pi over three, that just sounds like it's a little less than two pi, because two pi would be like six pi over three, right? Six over three is two, right? Two pi. So this is just a little less than two pi. I would bet that five pi over three is probably in this quadrant right here, quadrant number four, right? Because that's in quadrant number four, which is the C quadrant, the only thing that should be positive there is cosine and it's reciprocal, which would be secant. So therefore, tan will also be negative. Now, this is where things get kind of interesting. We got a reciprocal trig ratio here, secant of seven pi over six. Well, just worry about the seven over six. Seven over six is just a little bit more than one. So this is just a little bit over one pi. Well, we know where one pi is. One pi is over here. So a little bit more than that, that's probably about right there. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So anywhere that cosine is positive, secant will be positive as well. And the reverse is also true. Anywhere cosine is negative, secant will also be negative. Uh, notice we're in the T quadrant. The only thing that should be positive here is tan and therefore also cotan. So guess what? Three in a row here, we got negative. This is kind of a buzzkill. There's no positives here, my goodness. Uh, anyway, the last one, cosecant seven. Notice it doesn't say seven degrees. That would be a, a pretty clear one there. It's just seven. That tells us we're dealing in radians here. Now, radians usually are kind of in terms of uh, pi. Just remember a full circle is two pi. Well, two pi is like two times 3.14, roughly. That's a huge approximation, but two times 3.14, that's roughly 6.28. We can see that seven is a little bit more than 6.28. So I would be willing to bet that seven is probably in this quadrant right here. And guess what? The A doesn't lie. In quadrant number one, all are positive. So I don't even care the fact that this is uh, the reciprocal of sine. I know all of them are going to be positive there. And that includes the reciprocals. So positive is what that one is going to be. The kind of slimy thing about that question is even if you had thought it was seven degrees, you still would have gotten it right because that's that's also in quadrant one. But whatever, whatever. I'm not going to I'm not going to debate that. All right. Last couple of things of the day. Uh, unusual domains. So every domain that we've been considering so far is basically just your standard 0 to 360 or 0 to 2 pi if you're using, uh, if you're using radians. Uh, it's important to consider which quadrants your given domain will cover, though, because sometimes it's not that, uh, that normal old domain. So for each of these questions here, determine the exact measure of all angles that satisfy the following. We are going to want to draw a, a diagram for each one. So for this first one, we have sine of theta equals negative root 3 over 2 uh, for theta between negative 90 degrees and positive 180. Here's how I go about doing this one. Let's start with a little diagram. Starting with a diagram here, we don't know what our angle is. We haven't got the foggiest clue. I have no idea. But I do know what my domain is. It's negative 90 degrees to positive 180. A negative angle is just where you went clockwise from your starting point. So if we went clockwise from zero degrees, 
negative 90 leads us down here. So negative 90 is down here. So we are including everything from negative 90 degrees all the way to 180. So basically this whole scope right here, all of this in this range. So we're including this quadrant, this quadrant, and this quadrant. That's our full range, right? Because 180 is over there. So since we are worried about those three quadrants, let's also try to worry where this angle is. Notice it says sine theta is negative root three over two. There's a huge hint in the fact that it's just negative there. From the cast rule, C-A-S-T, sine should only be negative in these two quadrants. We're not even in this T quadrant though. Notice I put a check mark on all these ones. We're not in the T quadrant, so we can ignore that one altogether. That tells me that my angle must be down in this quadrant number four here. So if I was to draw that in, maybe I'll change back to red here just so we can see it. If I was to draw that in here, maybe I'm gonna say it's something uh, like, like this. I don't know, I'm just, just drawing a line for now, right? Just so I know where it is. Okay, we're getting closer to figuring out what this one's going to be. Remember, since it's between negative 90 and zero, we at least know kind of where our answer is gonna be and we want the exact measure of it. Now, to find the exact measure, you do one of two things. If you are super, super, super keen, ignoring the negative here, you might see root three over two and you might go, hey, wait a minute, root three over two, that's something I've seen in a unit circle. That'd be pretty impressive. If you didn't see that, join the club, right? Because most, most people wouldn't see that, it's not the end of the world. Let's see how we can solve this So To solve this as cheap as it feels, just use inverse sine on both sides. Just remember, we never use inverse trig on a negative. So I'm gonna use inverse sine on root three over two. And if we do that, just to double check, I'm pretty sure that's gonna be 60 degrees. Let's do this inverse sine of root three over two. And I was correct. Math has not changed since I last did it. There we go, 60 degrees, right? That is gonna serve as our reference angle. That's how much we're coming down from our X axis. We're going down 60 degrees. Here's the funny thing. Usually you'd say this is 360, we're gonna minus 60. So therefore that'd be 300 degrees. But notice our, our domain says it must be from negative 90 to 180. So we're actually going zero minus 60 degrees. Zero minus 60 degrees, of course, gives us theta equals negative 60 degrees. If that pains you to write a negative answer like that, yeah, I know what you mean, but it is what it is. Now you gotta be careful with questions like this because sometimes, notice from the cast rule, sometimes you might actually have an answer in more than one quadrant. Always just watch that just to be sure, okay? Last question, here we go. Uh, so same kind of idea, just finding the exact measure of these angles. Uh, this time we have secant theta equals one, and we're dealing for uh, a domain of negative pi to positive pi. So of course this time we're dealing with radians. Uh, let's draw a picture first of all, just to figure out where we're dealing with here. Uh, negative pi means if we went clockwise from zero, we're gonna go clockwise a full negative pi here. That's actually gonna take us way over here. So negative pi stops right there. But we're also going all the way to positive pi. Well, positive pi ends right there at the same point. It's coterminal to one another, right? So that means we could be in any of these four quadrants. Now, the tricky one is, though, these two down here are negative quadrants. They're not like your, your full-blown like pi to positive 2 pi. We're actually going negative here. So it's going to be a little bit of the pain to deal with those. Now, we see that secant theta equals 1. Well, secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So why don't I just take the reciprocal of this and say cosine is the reciprocal of 1 which if you think of one is one over one, the reciprocal of that is still literally just one over one. So cosine is just one, right? So we're looking basically for where cosine is equal to one. Now, you could be really lazy here and you could use inverse trig on this. Now, if you're gonna use inverse trig, remember we're dealing with radians. So you're gonna have to keep it in radians. That's all well and good. Or you could understand that cosine at least if we had a unit circle and the ratio will also work, cosine is just your X value. If we say cosine is equal to one, that just means we're right here, like literally at one, like literally just on the X axis there. Again, if you don't believe me, take inverse cosine. Even if you're in radian mode, it'll tell you the same thing. Inverse cosine is just one, or, or sorry, my mistake. What am I talking about? Inverse cosine of one, let me write this out so I don't get confused. Inverse cosine of one actually is zero. 
That's what I'm trying to spit out here, right? So zero, what is zero degrees, zero radians, same thing. It's right there. It's right there. It's on that line. Awesome. That, that's it, right? So we want to find the exact measure of all those angles. Guess what? That is an exact measure. So the exact measure of the angle, it's theta equals zero. That's it. Like that, that is literally, that's literally all we got here. And we're not going to be in different quadrants because remember you can say, oh, where is it? Where is it positive? Where is it negative? Well, this, this is going to be positive the same place cosine is positive from the cast rule. Cosine is positive in these two quadrants here. Well, since this is equal to one, guess what? It's right on the line, right between those two quadrants. Well, ha ha, right? Oh, and just for like bonus points here, imagine if this was like sine theta equals one. Remember sine is your Y value. If it was one, positive one, boom, you're up here right between sine and, and all. I don't know, I'm freaking out over nothing here. So long story short, the only answer on this one is theta equals zero. And that's zero radians, just to make sure, because it did give us our domain in radians. Interesting stuff. Anyway, we're done for the day. That was, uh, that was a long lesson, I apologize. But for practice, page 201, questions one, three to 10, 13 to 19. And as always, if you need extra help, please let me know.